Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Catholic Jury Arts Exhibition Lecture, held in conjunction with these, this year's exhibition. My name is Jordan Hainsey, and I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Covington, Kentucky, and I've served as this year's exhibition manager. I was blessed to work with the competition's founder, the late Lord Nathan Cochran, in the first instance as a student working in the gallery, helping him to hang the shows, helping him to work on the exhibition and gallery cards, and then later working with him more closely as an employee of the seminary in Archabbey as a graphic designer. This marks the fifth year that I've been involved with the Catholic Arts Competition, and I think Brother Nathan would be very proud of our endeavors, especially the college's commitment to the importance of this continuation of this great work. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to remember those who lost their lives yesterday in the tragic events at the Light Tree Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh's Squirrel Hill. St. Vincent has always been committed to Catholic Jewish dialogue through various arch and college initiatives, and we renew and continue that support today. We stand with our brothers and sisters in faith, remembering the great patriarchs, those who spoke with God face to face. They experience beauty itself. Beauty can truly be a means of healing the violence and tragedy in our world today. I ask that we please take a moment of silence. Eternal rest reign unto them, O Lord. Today marks a special day as we open the 7th Jury Catholic Arts Exhibition. The competition's founder, Brother Nathan, saw how sacred art can often be overlooked in the mainstream art world. He wanted to give artists working in the sacred arts a platform and venue to dialogue with the church, pastors, and the faithful in the hope of creating new artworks for liturgical, devotional, and private spaces. Since its inception, the competition and exhibition has received national attention and has blossomed with global interest, spurring submissions from nearly every continent. Most importantly, Brother Nathan saw that beauty can be the easiest and most effective way of communicating the gospel message. The great 20th century theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, I think, said it best and would sum up Brother Nathan's sentiments. Beauty seizes you. It changes you, and then it calls and sends you. Sacred art brings us back to that Garden of Eden where we're co-workers with God in the creation, and it helps us imagine what the future paradise might look like. I'd like to thank a couple of people who have been instrumental today in getting us to this day. I'm first off grateful to Andrew Julo, the gallery's curator. He's been instrumental in curating the exhibition and so many of the important behind-the-scenes details. I'm also very grateful to Father Robert Keffer, the gallery director, for his work in advancing the gallery's mission. I also want to thank Karen Strudelmeyers of the Rogers Center. She was very helpful this summer in processing a lot of the exhibition uh, submissions. A competition and exhibition of this nature requires a myriad of hours of planning, and we all wouldn't be here for, if it wasn't for all of these people. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our sponsors. The Diocese of Greensburg and Bishop Edward Molesic. Bishop, thank you. We're blessed to have you as our shepherd and your support of the sacred arts. I'd also like to thank Brother Norman Hips, President of St. Vincent College, Archabbey Douglas Nowicki of St. Vincent Archabbey, the Diocese of Huntington, the Most Reverend Roger Joseph Foyce, Joellen and Alan Yeastin, all of our sponsors can be found in your program that you have today, as well as the exhibition catalog that you'll receive in the gallery. Now I'd like to welcome Bishop Molesic to the podium to offer a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. So Jordan, in your letter, you said to offer a few brief words. So in case I can give you a few, I'd like to be brief. But bishops are known to multiply words and, and not bread and fish. <laughs> So that would have been four years ago, something like that. 
and what an amazing idea, how tremendous this is, and what a great collection of artwork that inspires and lifts up. And I was glad to know that this occurred routinely, and I'm glad to be here today. Um, I, had, I didn't really pay attention to where this meeting was going to be held, so I was up in the gallery, wondering why I was the only person there and the person at the desk. But I said, well, I'm here a little early, so I'll, I'll take a look around. And once again, the artwork is very uplifting and inspiring. In my house, there's a, a mixture of, of work that's very uh, obviously sacred and some work that's not so obvious. So in my dining room, I have a picture of steps. And to me, it's very sacred because it reminds me that either God is coming down to me or I'm going up to God. And then uh, in my Diving downstairs, I have pictures of lilies to remind me of the gospel passage that we shouldn't worry about the day. God takes care of the day for us. And as I go down the steps, I have a picture of two sheep. Uh, and it's not because I'm a farmer, but because it reminds me of my, my role as a shepherd. One sheep is looking at me as if it hears my voice. One sheep, sheep is suddenly looking ahead as if to say, I don't care what you say. So <laughs> it's a good image of the church. <laughs> religious, religious art is a, a visual prayer. I see it as a visual prayer. It lifts our minds, our hearts, our souls up to something and beyond. And religious art is also a visual catechesis. It teaches us about who we are. Sometimes in our humanity, as the one um, piece of art shows in humanity, one person to another. It also teaches us about the, the goodness of God and the desire of God to be one with us. So I hope the art that you hear, you see, uh, will inspire you as well and become a prayer for you. Uh, as Jordan mentioned, we are only several miles away from one of the greatest tragedies uh, in the history of Jews in America and certainly one of the greatest tragedies in our area the massacre of those people in Tree of Life Synagogue. Would that we see the beauty of each other. Would that our minds and our eyes be attuned to see beauty rather than ugliness. Maybe the Lord gives us beauty to teach us how to be better, to teach us how to see those things that inspire us. And not just on canvas or in stone, but in each other, since after all, each of us is a piece of work. <laughs> and a piece of work. <laughs> a rendering of God in the flesh. As we experience the art of the gallery, may we experience the art of one another and respect the art all around us. I'm really looking forward to hearing you next time. Thank you all. I'm now very pleased to present to you today's lecture in 2018 Catholic Arts Journal. World-renowned jurors working in the areas of sacred art and art history have brought their expertise to the Catholic Arts competition and exhibition throughout the years, and they can even span continents, much like some of this year's artwork. This year, our juror comes to us from Rome, Italy. She's an American-born art historian who specializes in Christian art and architecture is a professor in Rome at the Italian campuses of Christendom College in Duquesne University, and a licensed guide for the city of Rome and the Vatican Museums. She holds a BA in Art History from the University of Chicago and a PhD in Art History from the University of Bologna. She has taught and lectured in numerous international venues, including an address at the United Nations. She's been featured on History Television, EWTN, and has served as a Vatican analyst for NBC, the Today Show, Nightline, in 60 Minutes. She has also served as a consultant on art and faith for the Vatican Museums. She has written numerous articles and is the author of four books, including one published this September by Sophia Institute Press titled How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in the Counter-Reformation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Leto.
Wow. Well, thank you very much, Jordan. And thank you, all of you, for being here today, Your Excellency, for taking the time out. I am uh, really very honored to be surprised, honestly, when I was first asked, but I'm really very honored to be part of this uh, really extraordinary moment of revival. In, in Catholic art and I'm thankful to you especially the artists among you who are here today and I'm thankful to you the public who is willing to come out tearing yourself away from the football screens or whatever it is that people usually do on a Sunday afternoon in this country and uh, and, and really come out and, and explore and try to understand where art is going in this modern era so the way I uh, was thinking about about trying to address this this question today was a little bit of a question of what is Catholic art anyway? So for example, I teach history of Christian art and architecture. And you would be amazed to find out that if you go to most any major museum in the world and you look at 4th century AD remnants of art, the Christian art, the pagan art, it's all put together, it's all late antique. Because substantially, art history does not recognize the difference between 4th century Christian art and 4th century non-Christian art. So what is it that starts to define Catholic art? I think that's where we're going to start our little talk today. Uh, so, what, what's Catholic art? Is it art that's made by uh, a practicing Catholic? Is that, is that what it's going to take? Or is it depicting an evident biblical or hagiographical subject? Or does it just engage with themes that are very dear to Catholics? Something like pro-life or immigration or poverty. Um, I would like to propose that Catholic art does make good use of all of the above. Catholic art really is a very different way of seeing the world. What defines Catholic art is what sociologist Andrew, Father Andrew Greeley would have described the enchanted Catholic imagination. And so it, it means that the Catholic is inclined to see the holy lurking in all of creation. Those are his words. And he says that Catholics, even more so than Protestants, emphasize the presence, the actual presence of God in the world. So that's kind of where we're building from today. Um, and so I kind of, it's kind of like in, for, for Catholic, for Catholic artists, there's always a kind of supper of a Maos moment waiting for you. When you're walking along, you're doing your thing, and then suddenly you realize that the presence of God is among you. So, starting with that, the friendship between, because of that, the friendship between the arts and the faith is very, very old. It goes back to the third century when the Christians are trying, actually, it goes to the third century when the Christians who are attempting to evangelize in the Roman world, right? Here are the, here are the Christians trying to evangelize the Greeks and the Romans and the Gentiles, people who are essentially liter Ill illiterate in the story of salvation. Right? How many of the how many of the pagan Romans know anything about Moses? Anything about Abraham? And so the fact of the matter is they are, however, they are they are, however, very visually literate. They are accustomed to seeing images. They're accustomed to seeing symbols. So to begin with. Catholic artists, you already have a very very similar playing ground. The amount of people who don't have the foggiest about biblical stories is basically what keeps me in business as a guide at the Vatican Museums. But the fact of the matter is that there is at the same time this incredible understanding and, 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 and people who are used to seeing images, right? If there was ever an age that was bombarded with images, it is the age you're living in today. So this is your opportunity to speak to them in a language that they know. And in a certain sense, there are certain things that the Christians, when they begin to think about engaging with images, they want to stress very specific things about the faith. So let's start out, we're in the fourth century AD, and the very first question that the Christians are asking themselves, can we make this art? I mean, after all, the first commandment is pretty clear about that, thou shalt not make images of anything that flies in the air, walks in the yeah, yeah, yeah. So how are we going to get around that one? But this idea that God becomes, the, the word becomes flesh. And then these beautiful words of John Paul II explaining how the mystery of the incarnation, how, how God himself becomes visible, knowable, touchable, it, 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 the part of the human experience is what opens up the door for Christians to start making art. And so we have these first images, these first exquisite images. Obviously the one on the left is a first image. The one on the right was made more recently. The, um, 
but this first wonderful image of the Good Shepherd, what do we send out in the world? What is our first calling card for Christ in the history of Christian imagery? It's this image that's drawn from the ancient Roman, the ancient Roman image of philanthropy. The Romans invented that guy over there holding the sheep on his shoulders. Philanthropy, the willingness to take another person's financial or civic burden on his shoulders. And so the Christians take that image, they build on it, and they use it to explain, well, Jesus will take your burden of sin. They make Jesus youthful. They make necessary adjustments. Instead of an older man, which the Romans will favor, they'll make him look youthful, like the god Apollo, the image of light, youth, divinity. He can do this because he's God. And then, of course, that direct allusion to Scripture, these two beautiful moments that bracket Jesus' mission on earth, that, that both occur through parallels with the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd that will leave the 99 sheep on the mountain to come and get the one lost sheep. And the idea of that, that, that coming into the world, the incarnation itself. And then when he speaks of himself as the Good Shepherd who will lay down his life for his sheep and can pick his up again, there we have the image of the redemption, the death and resurrection of Christ. And so in one image, look at one image, the Christians managed to give so much depth and breadth to the story with one image that could speak to the Roman people and yet at the same time add this new enchanted special cast of God coming into the world. And so one of the things I really wanted to say that in, in going through these 311 entries, especially since I, 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 up until really going through these entries I was often seen beating my head against the wall going, what has happened to art these days? What I saw in these entries was a tremendous variety and many, many, many ways that people are trying to represent the incarnational into the world in a new, modern, interesting way. There's, I'm here to give you a message of good news and hope from the art world, from you. Not a, oh my goodness, we're so far away from Michelangelo. I don't know if Michelangelo would get much traction today, frankly. So the next thing that art needs to be is evangelical. The other thing that Christians begin to realize is that art, not only does it need to be evangelical, but as the years go by and the centuries pass, the Christians are not, they don't want to, they don't want to contain their story into just static symbols. The Christians get interested in storytelling. They want to be able to recount. Jesus uses parables. He tells stories. He paints literary pictures when he talks to make people understand. So the art begins to move in a direction where it wants to start to paint literary pictures. We see this as, as, as we're here at Benedict XVI's meeting of the artist, this idea of a human history, a human history stories of humanity that interconnect, that flow from the beginning of time to the ultimate moment of the Last Judgment. And so we start to see developments in art. So side by side with this need for storytelling, this new way of telling the ancient story in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, we see the development of perspective. We see the development of nature. We start using more nature, although I must admit Giotto is always um, very identifiable in an art history exam in that he produces broccoli trees. I always think of them as broccoli trees. Charming. But, but the, and the amazing, here's what Giotto does that's so fun and new and interesting. So we have St. Francis preaching to the birds. And then here in the background, look at the surprise. So there he is with his companion. They're out in, the, out in the forest. Francis starts talking to the birds. His companion's looking at him like, what, what is going on? That natural, normal human reaction that frankly most of us would have if we were out, you were standing in the garden, and people see your, your, your husband starts talking to the squirrels, and the squirrels seem to be listening, and you'd be like, what? that amazement. That amazement when you find yourself in the presence of something that is greater. Or sometimes you don't understand what's going on. It's one of my all-time favorite paintings. This is also by Giotto. It's from the Scrivenia Chapel. It's the Annunciation to St. Anne. It's all part of the stories of the Virgin Mary. And over here you have Anne. Her husband hasn't con gone home. This is the story of Anne and Joachim, the parents of the Virgin Mary. Joachim has been ostracized from the temple. He's gone off into the desert. Great, that's a great picture too. And there she is at home trying to figure out what happened. Giotto is using a brand new rudimentary form of what we call optical perspective. It's not as mathematical as one point linear perspective, but he's created space, right? And what's more, He's created a very orderly space, hasn't he? 
Anna and Joachim had everything nicely ordered in their lives. You can't help it. That's the impression you get. Everything is tidy on the shelves. Everything is put away nicely. There's that nice, wonderful, devout Anne saying her prayers. And in through the little window comes an angel who doesn't quite fit in the window. One of my favorite figures in the history of art is Giotto's crazy angel whose wings are stuck in the window. And I'm like, I'm trying to get in here. Hold on a second. And that's what a beautiful way of explaining, of illustrating, of making us feel that surprise that happens when the supernatural, the divine, when God interrupts your nice ordered plans and presents you with something slightly uncomfortable, awkward, unexpected, that doesn't fit right. And for all that, there's Anne in the middle of this, you know, I've got an angel coming in my window, and what's happening out here? The maid who's kind of listening at the door like, what's going on in there? And so it then brings another reflection to us. How do we behave as spectators towards the extraordinary? We may not all be St. Francis. We may not all be St. Anne. But the artist forces us to ask, what do we do when we suddenly find ourselves in the presence of something extraordinary? So this is, again, another beautiful moment in the history of art where we really start to work on the question of, of storytelling and how to tell stories. And we do have several works like that in this, in this exhibition. You know, when you go to look at that exhibition, you'll see this sort of large scale figures the same size, almost the same size as yourself, this feeling of being involved in a story. And this is another way that artists are responding today or picking up on these great um, traditions, these new ways of telling stories in some respects. The beauty of this particular perspective where, where the Virgin is about to walk out towards you. So picking up a little something from Giotto who kind of catches you in the scene, now you have a more direct moment whereas the angel is going, is looking towards Mary. Mary looks like she's ready to come towards you, already bringing grace into the world. And then a different, a completely different perspective, a completely different view of after the Annunciation, asking us to think about the story a little bit deeply, more deeply, from another perspective. So the same way we sort of looked at St. Anne's story for a second from the perspective of the maid sitting in the, in the other room, at this moment we look into this room, we're spectators looking into the moment when human history changes. And so this sort of remarkable uh, 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 hope, a remarkable sign of new ways of thinking about very, very ancient stories. And then the last thing that uh, Catholic art really worked towards was universality. Something, something for everybody. As the world got bigger in 1492, we found out we had to evangelize the people we brought in, found out we people that we didn't know existed 10 years earlier and then next thing you know you have Matteo Ricci over in China and the world gets bigger and bigger and bigger and how are we gonna how are we gonna make an art that can speak to such a big world and in that particular period we started to pull out our big guns uh, Michelangelo's starkness that pure power of the creation of man. Adam, who is this, this figure of pure potential, lying on the ground, looking at first glance, like there's really not a lot going on there. I often like to say that Adam looks like he's trying to hit the snooze button on the alarm clock. But when you look more closely, that strong shoulder, that strong knee, that potential in Adam, that potential in every man, that potential in every woman, that potential in every one, of God's human creations that Michelangelo summed up, it doesn't matter where you're from, as we know from the 6.5 million people that go to the Vatican museums every year and stand underneath that image. It doesn't matter his color, it doesn't matter his somatic features, it is that human potential that every single one of us has that Michelangelo captured. One of the most amazing images of universality possible and that little moment that little bitty moment right before God activates that latent potential. The bent knee, that bent shoulder, that tightness, that, that almost like a runner at a starting block, waiting for that moment when the contact will happen. And then that arm will lift, the leg will lift, and Adam will take, take possession of that full potential that God has given him. So, and then of course the Baroque, because 
I really love the Baroque. Um, then we have the Baroque, where Bernini gave us the altar of the chair of St. Peter's, where if you don't, you don't feel something standing at St. Peter's at 5 o'clock in the afternoon when the mass begins and the light comes bursting through that window, and it feels like the wall is dissolving and this golden light is pouring in and these stucco cherubim and seraphim are pouring out of the open space and the throne is floating in midair. There's nothing up here apparently supporting it and the bronze church fathers at the bottom. You're there at 5 o'clock. The choir is singing. You can't see it, but you can hear it, so it feels like a soundtrack. On a good day, they pull out the incense and the air is moving. Literally, Bernini, 16, 16, 1655, invented the IMAX theater for us. So something that every single person, you may think it's over the top. You may think, well, I don't really like action films. You may think whatever. But you definitely look at that, and it makes you catch your breath. So these are the great ways that the 16th and 17th, 16th, 17th century explored the concept of universality. And there, there is where we find ourselves in the 21st century, a little bit, a little bit on unsure footing. And the 18th century comes into being. Catholic art gets a little bit quieter, a little bit softer. It, it softens the teeth a little bit, and eventually it just sort of fades into yet another type of art genre. And so people tend to prefer, at this point, people start to be interested in other types of art. You don't see people commissioning Caravaggio to do a beheading of Holofernes for people's houses anymore. You don't see pictures of these sort of Eucharist inside a, a, a still life anymore. The, the desire for art, as art becomes less and less, uh, 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 as art begins to blend in with the other types of genres, we begin to find other types of genres. So I was like, this, I, this was my one little note. I did want to make a note about how I did think there was the possibility of universality. One thing is the new media. The new media do have a great potential for universality. So as photography begins to give us images that we can all understand the same way that TV speaks to all of us, photography speaks to all of us, we do have a great potential. And of course, in the images of our saints. Our saints still to this day are a universal calling card, especially some of our really extraordinary saints whose lives have already Already been such exceptional works of art that they've caught the imagination of the world and to bring them and to find ways to tell their story and to to bring them bring them back into the front and center stage is another way of creating the modern universality but the narrative I was getting involved in has to do with what happens when art just becomes more decorative what are people commissioning in the 1800s? What are people commissioning at the end of the 1700s at the, besides portraits? You have landscape paintings. Oh, that's nice. Very peaceful. Then we have still lives, which are lovely. Don't get me wrong. I'm quite fond of Monet. Um, we have lovely little scenes of boat parties and festivities. But all the while, artists begin to feel the need to wake people up. They don't feel the need to wake people up to their faith. They, and all the artists have understood that people have kind of gone to sleep in art. They like landscape paintings. They like pretty flowers. They like the Renoir redheads. Everything is just soft and quiet and fun to look at. It may be, we may argue about the technicalities of art, but art isn't really quite challenging. So artists follow that call, that call to kind of say something, to say something loudly, to express that need to, 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 to help people see things differently. But the upper hand goes to making people see things differently through shock. So we have the Manet painting, which is a brilliant piece of work, but nonetheless designed specifically to shock. After that, things get a little bit more interesting when Picasso comes along and we begin to get used to it, right? That's kind of what we expect from the art world. We expect our ideas to be shattered and awakened, but awakened to what? As a matter of fact, it's one of my all-time favorite works of art because in this one, Marcel Duchamp just told you exactly where art was going. Everything you needed to know was done in 1917 when he followed the line of he followed the line of the artist is just going to wake you up to wake you up to your logical conclusion. And he once he said this in 1917, I feel like no one needed to say anything else afterwards. That does not stop people, but there you go. And then we have of course, the inevitable, when you can't shock people anymore that way, then you start to go into scandal. You offend people's sensibilities. These are the two very famous images. 
of the uh, Virgin Mary covered with elephant dung and the so-called Kiss Christ. So at a certain point, you have art that's really just intended to, 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 to shock you. Shock you into what? Numbness? Wake you up to what? And so this is where, unfortunately, this is where you artists find yourselves in what we were discussing today as a new iconoclasm. You have an art world where people don't really believe very much in beauty. They think it's actually somewhat deceitful. Like you're not really telling the truth when you're making something beautiful because the world isn't beautiful. As a matter of fact, the world is ugly. Look at the ugly things that happened. Look at the ugly thing that happened yesterday. Why are you looking for beauty in a world that's so ugly? Isn't it better for us just to realize, just to be cynical? Isn't that just the good way we can put up a good hard shell? And I don't think that's really the way that art is going to uh, resolve its problems. I think there is an excellent chance in the midst of all the confusion and the torment and the, dis the, the, the disillusionment today that art, Catholic art, can bring back a sense of beauty to the world. And I have a couple little ground, ground, not ground rules, but sort of guidelines of things that have worked in the past and I suspect will work in the future. The very first thing is drawing. The ability to make them, if, if, if Christian art, if, if, if Christians have art because God became man and our art is incarnational, God did not come into the world as an amorphous blob. He did not come into the world as a paint blotch on a, on a canvas. He came in as a, as a tangible, knowable, if you've ever seen the Shroud of Turin, six foot tall guy, he came into the world with a form, a visible, understandable form. And so draftsmanship, drawing, is an excellent way for the artist to understand form. Now, how you draw, there are a million different ways you can draw, but when you draw, you bring forth your mind, that pencil, the most immediate connection between the two. And so in this exhibition, the amazingly beautiful drawings, whether or not they capture with that sort of... Um, sort of gentle, soft outline, that, that particular moment, that, that mysterious moment of the fingers holding the host. Over here you have these lovely sort of strong lines that intensify and then lighten this beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, pen workmanship to draw this story together. Or the work of a draftsman, which then gets, it gets worked over with watercolor, to capture spontaneity. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, when he was bored, you know what he did? He went out to capture things like um, with his pen and pencil, trying to capture a storm or trying to draw flooding waters. It's trying to capture something that is essentially non-capturable, and yet that's, what, that's part of what makes him such a magnificent artist. And so these wonderful ways that then you take that draftsmanship, you add the color, and suddenly you have presence. You have something that is there feels like it's there, feels like you can communicate with the saint, with this figure that's in front of you. It feels not, not only incarnational, tangible, physical, but also something that relates very directly to you as viewer. So that's one. Two, craftsmanship. And at the end of the day, before I was involved with this competition, before I got to know the incredible works of art that were submitted here, I've been, I've been saying for years and years, probably the best thing to do is to go back to really expert craftsmanship. Because at the end of the day, the problem is not really you, the artists. Part of the problem is the public doesn't really know what to do in front of a work of art. You've been, the public has been trained with these strange images, of diamond skulls, uh, 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 anything by Jeff Koons with like the cool lead, actually I can get a kick out of that stuff, but the fact of the matter is it's an art where you don't really, how are you supposed to react in front of it? Is it good? Is it bad? I don't understand it, but I kind of like it. But we can all understand craftsmanship. We can all understand when someone has dedicated time and skill and a God-given talent to produce something. We can all appreciate that. Anybody who goes into one of the mosaic churches in Ravenna or Rome or, or Venice and stands in front of these incredibly glistening transcendent spaces made up of teeny, teeny little tiles put together with good judgment, skill, attention, love, innovation, knows that craftsmanship will speak to people. And when you have people who are 
perhaps even a little bit more artistically illiterate than the Romans were. Romans were, were, were biblically illiterate, but not artistically illiterate. Now you have the problem of not only people who are biblically illiterate, but they're also a little artistically illiterate, because if you really think that the Kardashians are an art form, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so the, um, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the, the fine workmanship of craftsmanship is a key, key part in my mind. So whether it is the exquisite embroidery of a vestment, or, 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 or the beautiful craftsmanship, a mixture of uh, whether you're gilding the stucco or this rather remarkable one with these ones when you, when you go see it in the exhibition, you'll see these are all different fabrics mixed together with some of the paint directly on the canvas. This sort of a very tactile, beautifully uh, uh, combined different types of materials, different types of, of colors. This, this craftsmanship is something that we can respond to and we can appreciate. And uh, not just because I'm surrounded by a bunch of Benedictines here, <laughs> not, not playing the crowd. <laughs> But the fact is that one of the most important one of the most important revolutions in art happened in the 11th century, in the midst of one of the gravest moments of corruption in the church. Whenever people get excited at the Vatican museums about Alexander VI Borgia, and they're like, "Oh, you had such a horrible pope," and Alexander, I'm like, "Oh, thank God, they don't know about the 11th century." <laughs> we were we were at a very 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 dark moment, and there was a great tremendous moment of revival. And there were a lot obviously had to do with the profound spiritual revival brought about by the Benedictines who followed it up with beautiful art that was based on craftsmanship. Beautiful objects, beautifully structured things that people could go back to imagining just gentle, quiet, contemplative handiwork making something beautiful. And this brought about a tremendously exciting uh, moment of not only uh, 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 art, but also spiritual renewal in the church itself. So that said, here's the other thing we need, clarity. Um, I am uh, subject to a great many works of art because I live in Rome, and everybody's so very smart and sophisticated in Rome, so we obviously don't need to make images that look like anything anymore. I was going to show you the images of my favorite set of the uh, Stations of the Cross in the church in Rome, where literally, I, it's, which one do you think this is? It's like someone put handprints, and you have to figure out which station it is. Or what I like to call the teal squiggle, um, the, the, the teal squiggle syndrome, which is uh, at one point I was in a church and there were four brocade panels with teal squiggles on them. And I couldn't actually pay attention for the mass, for the entire mass, because I was like, what? What are those teal squiggles? I'm, I'm professional at studying images. Why do I not? And like halfway through the mass, I'm like, oh, it's the four, it's the four gospel writers. And literally, they like, said this out loud in sort of an embarrassing way in the middle of the mass. So, you know, I, the, the idea being, I hope you don't have teal squiggles. I'm, just, I'm so sorry if I'm offending anybody. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, clarity is a fundamentally important part of art. If you want to, if the artist to communicate, if Jesus did not come here to keep a secret to himself, like, okay, so you're all redeemed and God loves you, but I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> I came down here, but there's no reason for you to know what I'm doing. No. The point of the good news is the good news needs to spread, it needs to spread in such a way that people understand it. And that, a fundamental part of that is clarity, being able to understand what you're looking at. At which point, that makes icons it's this great moment for the revival of icons. And when you look at them, they're so clear. This is a magnificent meeting of craftsmanship and clarity. And you look and you understand that he is God. You understand when you look at these images, they, they focus you. They give you a sense of the preciousness of what this gift of our redemption is. And they, there's really no questioning who's the important picture in the person in the picture. There's actually very little questioning of who's in the picture to begin with. That would be Francis and Catherine of Alexandria, by the way. Um, the, uh, the fact is that clarity becomes very, very important. And so it doesn't matter how you make the picture clear. There are endless different ways. So here we take an image we've seen a million times. Right? How many of us have seen like the Pieta, the Pieta, the Pieta, the Pieta? And yet, in this particular work, in this particular almost snapshot detail, we have a moment. We have a silence in that moment. This isn't the hysterical, the weeping of the deposition. It's not even that, that, that same kind of intimacy where Mary is holding Jesus in the Pieta. 
you have the body laid out for the mother to come and begin the cleaning of that body. And this wonderful way that the, the, the picture puts us standing right behind Mary. So we're standing right behind the mother who almost touches her son for the first time since he was taken and arrested and, and tortured and killed. And she's touching him for the first time, and we stand right behind her. We stand right behind her. And then on top of that, with that, that work right above the altar, is there any more clear way you can make us understand the meaning of the body of Christ? And then we have vision. And this is the um, last part of our discussion. It's the most complicated part of our discussion, and it's the hardest part for you artists. When the Council of Trent, after a moment of doubting whether it would continue to, uh, to patronize art, art underwent, underwent a very serious crisis in the 16th century where artists were kind of doing whatever they wanted, they didn't really help with the program, and during the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent asked themselves, would they really want to continue to patronize art? Iconoclasm was at its, it was another sort of a massive moment. The Protestants, many of the Protestants were ridding themselves of art, talking about the useless expense, talking about the confusion, talking about lasciviousness, what good are these artists? And the church chose, in the face of all of that, to continue its support of the arts. It asked for clarity, it asked for intelligibility, and it asked for stimulus towards piety. Now, what's that, right? So, was that cattle prod? There you go. Get down, get down there, right? So, so, the um, stimulus towards piety, which I translated tonight into vision, a way that you artists and we public learn to see these ancient stories, these ancient messages with new eyes. And one of the things that really struck me in this uh, exhibition were these were the works of the new suffering, the suffering of the, the ancient suffering of the martyrs that's been going on since St. Stephen, right? Or arguably St. John the Baptist. But the way that we continue to have the suffering of the martyrs, even in our 21st century, and the same danger that happened almost to the martyrs of old that happened that our present martyrs are in, the loss of their story. The, the, the 21 cops killed on the beach in Libya, killed in public, it was an amazing idea. They were killed on television, right? They were filmed, the whole world watched it on television. This medium, this art form that was used to make us witness the most horrible brutality imaginable, and now we see it commemorating, starkly reminding us of that sacrifice and that, that victory of those men, remember that beautiful story, those men marching together, praying, and that last man who converted exactly at the moment, converted with that group. So we see that image, that ancient image of the palm frond, which reminds us of this stark, almost Caravaggio-like crossing of the finish line of Father Jacquemin, who again, martyred while celebrating the Eucharist, sitting there holding that host in his hands. What else? These are ways, this is how we don't forget these people. It's not sufficient to just put a feast day in the air and every day we have an optional memorial, maybe someone will write about them in Magnificat, but when we create images that are unforgettable, when we create images that make us remember, that's how we hold on to the memory of our great heroes, which is what these martyrs are. And then, and this very beautiful one with this, uh, these different ways that we can tell these stories, make them present, and keep our, what is it that Pope Benedict said, both as, as, uh, as cardinal and as pope? He said that the greatest apologetic for our faith is the beauty of our art and the lives of our saints. And so this new way in the 21st century that people have found to put the beauty of our art and the beauty of the lives of our heroes together, it's a very, very exciting thing to see happening. Then we have one of the things that I found most moving, really moving, is the way artists have an excellent way of identifying, sensing, 
that vision, that, 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 that enchanted imagination, sensing things that need to be reinforced in our society. And in this age where I think we would all agree that fatherhood has come under attack in, in extraordinary ways, where fatherhood with a, a lack of fathers, loss of fatherhood, loss of the meaning of fathers, how do we put that back front and center in people's lives? And how many images in different ways and in different forms from different artists coming from different countries who all identified this same need for us to see, value, admire, and hold up the image of the father, whether it's this uh, uh, fascinating take on the prodigal son, this, is, this is beautiful image of uh, Joseph's bundle of joy there, uh, another version of the prodigal son, uh, this one, this very moving one, this father and son under the cross taking this, taking this journey together, and then something a little bit more feels like you're looking into a sort of a family workshop. So these different ways that all of these different artists succeeded in bringing out a, 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 a problem that is a, an image that is very ancient, but a problem that is very present, and bringing them together through these works of art. And the uh, one last, I'm going to end on a final note here, these last couple of works. Um, one of the things that I really feel very strongly about is that art, um, art is not going to work if we just sit around and wait for people to put them in churches, in chapels. What is the locus of sacred art? Where do we go to see it most of the time? In a museum, right? If you want to see a holy picture, where do we go? We go to a museum. Well, <sighs> Could there be a more sterile environment for a work of art that's meant to be? I mean, it, 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 I, not, I, don't get me wrong. I, I love museums, but I do realize that when you, and I realize that the museums have often saved works of art. But the fact is that that is not a way to use the works of art for what they were. They were not created for that space. Those works of art, many of them, were created to be in front of altars, in front of kneelers, and in in. in in, in little shrines. Um, and then many of the works of art that we go to see in museums were meant to be in people's homes. Gifts that were given to a young man or a young woman coming of age. Gifts that were given to uh, a family with a newborn child. Gifts that were given at, at important moments in people's lives where you would put in front of you the image of the Holy Family. And so we used to keep art in our homes. And that's why we knew our Bible stories, because we had them right in front of us all the time. And we also, it just helped us to feel like we were part of the story. I know the story. I got a picture of it. I can tell you. But you want to know about St. Teresa? I can tell you all about St. Teresa. Yeah, she's, I think I see her every day when I'm a mom. Or, or as, 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 as the bishop told us, these images that are in the house, to remind you, I'm the, I'm the shepherd. I've got some sheep that are going to pay attention, and some that are just going in the other direction. A little reminder every day, these works of art that are meant to be part of our lives. And so I was delighted to see works that, and, and granted, I understand um, we have decorating ideas in our house, and having a giant Judith beheading Holofernes might seem fun to me. But of course, I'm antisocial, and I find it kind of nice to have that. Hi, do you want to come in? This is a Judith beheading Holofernes by Caravaggio. Don't mind the blood. Um, the, um, how do you fit this kind of art into our lifestyle, right? You don't want to have a big thing up there proclaiming, hi, I'm really taking my religion seriously. Would you like to have a glass of champagne? But something that's lovely, lovely, it's a beautiful thing. And then just at the bottom, you look at it, and you look at it again. You're like, hey, wait a minute. Is that the story of the passion happening underneath? A clever, clever way to introduce art into our homes, into our lifestyles, into our feng shui mode of decorating our living room that goes with our IKEA furniture, or our sort of our low-key Scandinavian design mode. There is the, when, we, when we start to produce things that people want to have in their homes, then we get our story in our homes. All of you made me look at art differently. I'm a 16th and 17th century, I'm a 16th and 17th century art scholar. That's what I do. I do pictures of Michelangelo and, and, and a picture by Michelangelo and Caravaggio and I like things to look a certain way and I'm very accustomed to looking at things a certain way and I, I had to come and look at art that was not, it was not in my comfort zone at all. I started by just going through the images every couple days, beginning to see which ones made me think. And then they, one of my favorite books is um, by Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark is sort of my hero as an art historian who apparently converted on his deathbed. And uh, Kenneth Clark, um, he wrote a tiny, tiny, tiny book. It's about, it's about 60 pages. What is a masterpiece? 
And his idea of a masterpiece was something that brings old and new together. Something that draws on something that we've seen a million times and then suddenly presents it in a very, very different light. And I think that's a very, very interesting direction for our new Catholic art to be going. So I had this one up on my wall, and people would look at it and they, what is that? Especially if you, if you, when you go up to the gallery, if you walk right up to it, you'll be like, what is that? Because it's just a bunch of dots. Then if you're standing on the other side of the gallery and you look across, you see very clearly that lovely outline of that, that face with the downcast eyes. Face, it looks kind of familiar to you, doesn't it? Something about those features, something about that expression, doesn't it look a little bit familiar, like you've seen it before? And so that, that image of this Mary, this, the ultimate image of fiat, Michelangelo gave us the ultimate image of fiat. And so in this painting, there's this outline of Mary, and then in front of it, there's all of this spattering, these sort of strange little dots, these strange little things that obscure her. But at the same time, through that patina, through that kind of complicated map of a journey, underneath it, there remains something solid, incarnational, and of a message that is distinctly and, 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 and clearly Catholic, that of that stalwart, consistent trust in the Lord. And so those are a little bit of the thoughts and the things that I learned from you when I was, and I had the great good fortune of looking over these works. I am very, very excited to, uh, to uh, see you see these works hanging in the exhibition. They're beautiful. I am very, very hopeful that you will begin to think more deeply about really trying to patronize more in any way possible, not buying the works and being interested in artists and talking to people about it, writing about it. Maybe when you're looking for something, if you have a little blog or you're putting up a posting for a holy day, maybe not something that was done by Caravaggio 400 years ago, but maybe we can find something from today that can celebrate the feast day of St. Teresa or the feast day of, 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 of uh, someone, I'm sure. I'm sure there's got to be someone who's having feast day. And so the fact of the matter is this is a great moment for us as patrons to really try to revitalize art. And of course, this is a reminder that you, artists, as Saint, that we just canonized, freshly canonized, Pope Paul VI said, you artists are the guardians of beauty in the world. And I thank you for persevering in these very, very difficult times to continue to make things that are so beautiful that gives people so much hope. So thank you, and let's go look at the show.